So in this video, we're going to come up with a mathematical description for acoustic waves. Now, we aren't going to go through the full derivation here because the full derivation is quite long and complicated, but we're going to show the basic principles that lie behind it. So to start with, what we're going to consider is a small element of a fluid, and we're going to consider its displacement. Now, when we're talking about acoustic waves, these are the waves that you're listening to me using. Sound waves are uh, acoustic waves. And these work by displacing the air molecules in this case. And when I displace the air molecules, they bump into the air molecules adjacent to them. And so we have a wave that travels through the system. But the wave travels where the displacement of the molecules is in the same direction of propagation of the wave. And so acoustic waves are longitudinal waves. And in a fluid like air, for example, or indeed in a liquid like water, uh, transverse waves will not propagate. And the reason for that is, is that the molecules inside a fluid are generally free to move around uh, and, and past one another. So while if they bump into one another, um, they will transmit energy. If one is moving in a direction perpendicular to the other molecule, there's no force in between them or very, very weak forces. And in fact, this is how we know that the core of the Earth is a fluid because it will transmit long longitudinal waves, acoustic waves, but it will not transmit transverse waves. And that's a property that fluids exhibit. So let's have a look at the displacement of an element of a fluid. So here we have a volume of the fluid that a wave is passing through at time t equals zero, and the wave is passing in the x direction only, not in the y and the z. And at some later time uh, t, then we have the situation we've shown here where this face of the element has been displaced by phi, which is going to be a function of both the position and the time. And this element of the face has been displaced by phi, but now where we have uh, the phi has the argument of x plus delta x, not just x, as we had for the front face. Because as we know, the displacement of a medium is going to vary with the uh, actual physical position of the medium. And so here we're starting with a different physical position, so we're going to end up with a different physical displacement. So what we want to know is what is the change in volume of this element? Well, the change in volume here is going to be delta y and delta z. Those don't change, but we want a volume, so we've got to multiply by them. And then what we want is we want the difference in the displacement of this face um, versus the displacement of this face. So that will give us the change in the length in the x direction. Because if this, as shown here, right, this, this face here is displaced by more than this face, and so that will result in a change in volume. So what we have is we have phi of x plus delta x at time t minus phi of x and t. Uh, uh, so uh, position x and time t. So that gives us our change in volume. Now what we want, we were talking about bulk modulus, so what we want to calculate is the fractional change in volume, so that's delta v over v0. Well the original volume here, we've got x, we've got x plus delta x, so the length of this side is just delta x along here. So our original volume is going to be uh, delta y delta z times delta x. So when we divide this by uh, that, then what we end up with, so we're going to end up with delta v over delta x delta y delta z. And this will give us phi x plus delta x uh, t minus phi of just x comma t all divided by delta x, because the delta y and the delta z cancel out with uh, the delta y and delta z there. So that gives us our fractional change in volume. Now, if we go back to our definition of bulk modulus, remember we have bulk modulus is equal to minus the change in pressure divided by the fractional change in volume. So I can rewrite that and say that the uh, fractional change in volume is equal to um, minus delta P over B, the bulk modulus. Now, 
I'm going to write delta P here. I'm going to define it slightly differently. I'm going to say that delta capital P, that's the change in pressure, I'm just going to call that little p, and that's going to be equal to the actual pressure of the medium at a point, that's capital P, minus the nominal pressure. So this is sort of the uh, pressure if there was no wave there at all, and the medium was just sitting there at rest. So when I do that, then I get this equation here that... Um, P divided by B is equal to, and then I've got to put in a minus sign here, and then I've got phi of X plus delta X at T minus phi of just X and T, all divided by delta X. So now I'm going to take the limit as delta X goes to zero. And when I do that, what I've got here is I've got the change in displacement with respect to x for a constant time, right? I've got the difference in displacement between x plus delta x and x for a constant time. I have the same time in both things, and I'm dividing it by delta x, which of course is going to, to zero. So what happens when I take this limit is that I find that this pressure difference, little p here, is equal to minus the bulk modulus, and then all I've got here is a partial derivative of partial phi um, with respect to x, right? So partial phi by partial x, keeping the time constant. And then all I have to do now is I've got to take another partial derivative. I'm going to take the partial derivative with respect to x of both sides of this equation, and what I end up with then is I end up with partial p by partial x, because I'm uh, the pressure here is going to be a function. This is the pressure differential, so the difference in pressure between the actual pressure and the nominal pressure, and that's a function of both position and time. So partial p by partial x is equal to minus b times partial squared phi by partial x squared. So we've got our first relationship that we need for showing the wave equation. Here we're going to get our second one. So we've got our element of fluid, and we're going to consider the pressure that is acting on the fluid here. And so what we've got is we've got a pressure acting on this side of our element of fluid, and we've got a different pressure acting here because we've got P plus delta P. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply Newton's second law to this, and I'm taking the uh, positive direction is the same as the positive x direction. So if I look at this, I'm going to have a net force. And my net force, uh, so Newton's second law, of course, is force is equal to mass times acceleration. And I'm only going to do it in the x direction. So my net force is minus delta p times delta y times delta z. Now, the reason it's that is because the pressure cancels out, the capital P cancels out, except for the fact that there's a change in pressure at this side of the uh, fluid element, and so I have this delta P left over. That's a difference in pressure. To turn it into a force, pressure is force per unit area, so I have to multiply it by the area of this side of the element. And it's minus because if delta P is positive here, that means an increased pressure on this side, which generates a net force acting in the negative x direction. And similarly, if the pressure difference here is negative, in other words, this is a pressure drop here, then I would generate a positive force. So there's a sign difference between the pressure, change in pressure, and the uh, value for the force. So I have to put a minus sign in here. And then for the mass, I'm going to write this, since we're dealing with a fluid, as the density of the fluid multiplied by the volume of the fluid element, which is just delta x, delta y, delta z. And then for the acceleration, well, so these are the x coordinates, but remember, we've got a wave passing through in the uh, positive x direction, so there's going to be some displacement phi for this element. And I'm treating the element as a whole here. I'm assuming it's so small that the entire element is displaced by roughly the same amount. So it's a, we're waving our hands a little bit here because previously we're assuming different displacements at either end. Here, I'm assuming a same displacement for this overall uh, element of fluid. 
And so here, for the acceleration, of course, I'm keeping the x-coordinate constant because, again, I'm, I'm assuming this is an infinitesimally small uh, fluid element, so I've got a constant x-coordinate. And so what I have is I have the partial derivative of the displacement with respect to time to the second order keeping the position constant. And that's why it's a partial derivative because I'm looking at a fluid element at a constant coordinate and I'm asking what is its displacement um, given its particular x-coordinate. So this is our equation we got from Newton's second law. Well, I can cancel the delta y's, I can cancel the delta z's, and what I'm going to get if I rewrite this is that delta p over delta x is equal to minus rho times partial squared phi by partial t squared, uh, again, for a constant uh, uh, position x. And so now, of course, all I'm going to do is take the limit as delta x goes to 0. And when I do, I'm keeping the time constant uh, here. And so I end up with partial p by partial x is equal to minus rho and then partial squared phi by partial t squared. And so I've got two expressions now for partial p by partial x, and all I have to do is put them together. So now here I've got my two expressions. Now the one thing I've sort of glossed over a little bit is you remember we defined little p as equal to big P, that's the pressure at a point, minus P0. And so if I'm differentiating this because this is a constant, it goes to zero and doesn't affect anything. So partial uh, what I can say is partial little p by partial x is equal to partial big P by partial x, because when I differentiate, this is a constant and goes to 0. So I can say that these things now are equal to one another. And when I do that, we get the wave equation for acoustic waves. And what we end up with is we end up with partial squared phi by partial x squared is equal to rho over b times partial squared phi by partial t squared. And if we compare that to the general wave equation, we can see that this is 1 over c squared. And so that tells us that the phase velocity for an acoustic wave, c, is just going to be the square root of the bulk modulus divided by the density. And so what this means is for an increasing density, we get a lower wave speed. And for an increasing bulk modulus, so an increasing resistance to being compressed, we get a higher wave speed. Now we've seen that rather hand wavy argument for how to derive the wave equation for an acoustic wave in terms of the displacement of the medium. However, for acoustic waves, we have an alternative way to derive the wave equation. We can look at the pressure of the medium, because when I generate, when I kick air molecules out of my lungs, these bang into the air molecules next to them, and that is going to raise the pressure of the atmosphere at that point. And so what we're going to find is that we can also describe an acoustic wave as a pressure wave. So to do that, let's have a look at the change in velocity of uh, the air molecules or the change in velocity of the medium as we move through a fluid. So here we have our element of fluid, but now we're going to consider the change in velocity between this face, which is having a velocity of u, and this face, which has a velocity u plus delta u. And we want to relate that to the change in volume. Well, the first thing to say is, what, how can we write down delta u? Well, the change in velocity between one face and the other is just the rate of change of velocity with respect to position for a constant time, because we're looking at, a, a, at an instant in time, multiplied by the change in position. So the velocity here and the velocity here will be different because we have a rate of change of velocity with respect to distance at a constant uh, time, right? So this is why we have the t here. Now, we can ask, what is the change in the volume of this element? Well, we're going to get a change in the volume because after some period uh, delta t, so after a small interval of time, this face will have moved u plus delta u times delta t. And this face will have just moved u times delta t. And so we're going to have a change in volume 
that, uh, or the change in length here is going to be delta u times delta t. Remember, we're only talking about displacements in the x direction. So our change in volume is going to be uh, delta y times uh, delta z multiplied by uh, delta u times delta t. And then I'm just going to use this expression here to get rid of my delta u. And what I'm going to end up with is partial u by partial x at constant time, and then delta x, delta y, and delta z, and delta t. So then I'm going to say, well, what is the fractional change in volume? Well, the original volume is just delta x, delta y, delta z. And so that simplifies this expression a lot. And I just end up with partial u by partial x at constant time uh, multiplied by delta t. Now, we know from our definition of bulk modulus, and when we were looking at the acoustic wave equation just earlier, we can write this, we can say that our change in pressure, so our change in pressure is equal to minus the bulk modulus times delta V over V naught. So I can rewrite this now as delta P over delta T is equal to, and then I've got to have minus B and then multiplied by partial U by partial x at constant time, because I've taken the delta t over to the pressure side of the equation. And then, of course, now I just take the limit as delta t goes to 0, and I end up with partial p by partial t is equal to minus b times partial u by partial x. Now, I'm not going to I'm going to stop there and I'm not going to go through the rest of the derivation because all we're doing at this point is we're going to go back to Newton's second law which we've already applied and we're going to look at the derivatives with respect to time and we're going to use a little trick of partial derivatives which when you differentiate with respect to a different variable so if I take du by dx I can differentiate it with respect to time and you end up with sort of more complicated things so and and the ordering of you do that doesn't matter and so we're going to be we're going to have to rely on more knowledge of partial derivatives than we than I want to cover uh, here so this is sort of how you started at least and what you end up with when you put it together with Newton's second law and you you take this and you differentiate it or do the partial derivative with respect to time add it to Newton's second law what you end up with is you end up with an equation that gives you partial p squared um, with uh, partial x squared is equal to and then we have um, rho over b and then partial p by partial t squared. And so this is the same acoustic wave equation, but now what we've written it in is in terms of the pressure p, and this could either be the pressure p or the pressure differential, uh, uh, little p. It doesn't matter because, of course, we're taking, the uh, we're taking a differential, so that constant disappears. But we've written the wave equation now in terms of a pressure wave. So now we've derived two wave equations which both describe acoustic wave. On the one hand, we can describe it as a displacement wave, and on the other hand, we can describe it as a pressure wave. But it's crucial to understand that these are both descriptions of the same physical wave. There is only one acoustic wave. We can just describe it as a pressure wave, or we can describe it as a displacement wave, whatever is easiest for the application we're considering. And what we've shown is that the speed of that wave depends on the bulk modulus of the medium and the density of the medium. And so an increasing density will reduce the speed, and an increasing bulk, bulk modulus will increase the speed. And this is the reason why sound waves travel so much faster in water than they do in air. On the face of it, you might expect the sound waves to travel a lot more slowly in water because water's got a density about a thousand times uh, greater than that of air. However, water is incredibly uh, resistant to compression. Its bulk modulus is 10,000 times higher than that of air, and that is why water waves, uh, your know, acoustic waves through water, travel a lot faster than acoustic waves through air. It's the bulk modulus of water overcomes the increased density of water. So now we've got a description for acoustic waves traveling through 
any medium.